In this slide presentation, we're going to take a quick look at what a landscape is. Now, the word landscape actually comes from the Dutch, landschap, uh, from Middle Dutch specifically. And also, shop or skop also comes from a verb of Germanic origin, skapken schaffen, which means literally shaped lands. So, landscape, land is land, and then shop, skop, shape, uh, shaped land. In other words, a landscape is something that has been created uh, in relation to the land. Now, the meaning originally from the Dutch means region or tract of land. Uh, the term was first recorded in 1598, and it was borrowed from painters' terms, uh, Dutch painters' terms. And you may know if you studied art history that in the 16th century, Dutch artists were actually masters of the landscape genre. Later, uh, when it, the word enters English, it carries with it that association with painting. Landscape in the British sense means a picture depicting scenery on land. Now, interestingly enough, 30 years, 40 years pass after the first recorded use of landscape in English before the word is ultimately used to mean a view or a vista, some sort of natural scenery. And this delay suggests that people were first introduced to landscapes or the idea of landscapes in paintings and then began to see landscapes in real life. Thus, the idea of landscape contains within it the idea of perspective that of someone or something viewing, a view. A single landscape may be experienced from one or more viewpoints, and, in, and at each point it may be viewed in one or more directions. So a landscape is also a particular view of the land. Another definition of landscape, this one from Peter Goodchild, describes a real or imaginary environment, image or view, in which the land is prominent. Landscapes may and often do include humans and mad main components as well and are the product of the appearance, uses, and perceptions of places. When man made, we refer, we refer to these as cultural landscapes. Cultural landscapes may be urban or rural, archaeological or industrial, but they are always the result of humans' interaction with the environment and each other. In the words of Carl Sauer, cultural landscape is fashioned from a natural landscape by a cultural group. Culture is the agent, the natural area is the medium, the cultural landscape is the result. Cultural landscapes are man-made expressions of visual and spatial relationships, narrative cultures, and expressions of regional identity. According to the World Heritage Committee of UNESCO, there are several different kinds of cultural landscapes. There is a landscape clearly defined, created, and designed deliberately by human beings. This can include landscape areas in parks, constructed for aesthetic reasons, uh, sometimes associated with religious buildings or other types of monuments. Uh, also ecologically evolved landscapes due to social, economic, administrative, or religious needs. These landscapes have evolved over time into their current form as a response to the adaptation to natural surroundings. And according to UNESCO, there are two subtypes, ancient landscapes that are no longer a living space, but the original characteristics are still visible. This would include like archeological sites and active landscapes, which conserve an active landscape, which conserves an active social role in the contemporary society associated with traditional lifestyles and in which, and which is still continuing to evolve. And this would be pretty much any kind of urban or rural landscape that is being lived in in an active way by human beings. And then there are associate cultural landscapes, those in which powerful religious, artistic, or cultural associations exist within the natural surroundings. So you can kind of get a sense of cultural landscape is literally what the word means, which is a landscape that has been shaped deeply by human beings according to a set of cultural values. So like I said, they can be agricultural, they can be uh, archaeological. Uh, they can be industrial. Here we see the Bethlehem Steelworks in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And they can also be constructed to serve a particular religious, spiritual, or social need. Uh, later in the semester, we're going to be doing a virtual tour of Oakland Cemetery, which is another kind of very self-consciously man-made landscape. Cultural landscapes evolve over time. 
They can be the expression of economic relationships, communal values, communal values or ethnic identity. If we look at urban landscapes, for instance, we can see that they layer each other over time. We might see structures from different periods of time within the same landscape. Historical cultural landscapes may devolve from their original context and be adaptively reused. In any case, they are the expression of larger cultural values and relationships. Now, I just wanted to sort of share with you a couple of images from Philadelphia and talk about the way in which particular kinds of landscapes get created in space and time. If we look at Philadelphia, which was a colonial and early Republican city, we can see uh, that there are several shared styles that are very particular to that time. And as we look at the landscape, of historic Philadelphia. If you've ever been to Independence and National Historic Park, you've walked through this landscape. There are definite building types, definite styles of early federal construction, and then also, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner, a Greek Revival, also very common during this period in a lot of the public buildings of this period. The national banks um, uh, take this Greek temple-like uh, form, as do many um, residences. And this, these sort of become part of the fabric of the landscape of the walking city of the early uh, 19th and late 18th century. We also see landscapes that layer on to this template uh, with uh, expressions of ethnicity. Uh, so in the case of Chinatown in downtown Philadelphia, we can see that Asian motifs and elements that are particular to the culture of these residents have been literally put onto this historic federal row house form. You can see this early federal row house all throughout Center City in Philadelphia. And in the case of Chinatown, the addition of language signage, uh, other kinds of cultural motifs uh, and adaptive reuse as even things like a Buddhist temple have given an ethnic overlay onto this historic landscape. We also see this uh, in North Philadelphia in El Barrio where Latinx uh, migrants and immigrants have adapted, again, the row house form, a classic Philadelphia form of the 19th century, uh, and infused it with uh, ethnic aesthetics and uses that are particular to that ethnic community. So here, since we have both a historical landscape with historical structures that date to a specific time, but that landscape has evolved over time and now is also uh, can be mapped in terms of its ethnic and other cultural features, uh, including uh, things like these decorative iron balconies and grating that are added to the front of these 19th century row houses to give them a Caribbean feeling. Finally, cultural landscapes also shape relationships between those who populate and create them. This can include relationships of power, such as those expressed in the Southern slave plantation. Check out the next slideshow for how to read such a landscape.